Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series A Father's Farewell, a study of the book of 2 Timothy. The book of 2 Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy, and through him to all the sons and daughters of God. We hope this helps you understand and apply God's Word in your life today. We are going to be beginning a new series today on 2 Timothy. Uh, I'm calling the series A Father's Farewell, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a, in a couple of minutes, but we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 to 7 today, uh, what I'm entitling A Father, A Son, and the Spirit. And I'll again explain that uh, why as we go through. Uh, so we'll be looking at 2 Timothy over the next couple of months as we head all the way actually into May probably to try and just work through uh, this final letter of the Apostle Paul. I did introduce it uh, in an After Hours video this past week. If you didn't watch it, you might want to jump in just to see a little bit about 2 Timothy and also what's known as the pastoral epistles, which is First and Second Timothy and Titus and kind of the unique place they have uh, in the Scripture. So we'll be looking at the first seven verses. They will be up here on the screen. They're in your booklet. And I encourage you, as always, to follow along in your Bible. So let's hear the Word of God together. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and, I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. As I was thinking through the beginning here of this letter in 2 Timothy, I was reminded of George Washington's farewell address. It was a famous letter that uh, George Washington wrote to the people of America. He was the father of our nation, and at the end of his time in office, he wrote this letter, and it's quite famous. Actually, I was surprised. Uh, I glanced at Facebook for just a minute this morning and saw that our governor referenced Washington's farewell letter. So hopefully he's even listening in this morning to hear uh, what I have to say about it. Um, But he was bringing it up because in Washington's farewell letter, Washington, the father of our nation, is, is kind of writing off the scene and he's bringing up and saying, these are the things I'm most concerned about. And he warned us and said, there's going to be a temptation to getting a spirit of disunity among the people. That there's going to be a temptation to not just be a nation, but to divide into political parties. That we're going to be tempted to compromise the separation of powers. We're going to start trying to have the Supreme Court do things that the legislature is supposed to do and the presidency do things the legislature is supposed to do. That we're not going to want to follow the Constitution as it is written. And we're going to forget the importance of religion and morality. And as I say all those things, of course, you realize what silly fears they were for President Washington because... None of those have come to pass here in America, right? Now, he brings all these things up to us, and the reason I'm bringing it up is not even because of the specific things he says, but because Washington, after a career of service, and I think it's safe to say if you look at the history, even the other founding fathers said if George Washington had not been here America would have not become a nation. We would not have made it to this point. He was the one indispensable founding father. And put yourself in Washington's place. After a life of service to this people, 
if you're going to have one final statement, would you take time and carefully think through what you were going to say, or would you just whip something up off the cuff? You would, you would carefully think through what you want to say. These are your final parting words. Well, I bring this up because 2 Timothy are Paul's final words. They are Paul's farewell address to his young spiritual son, Timothy, and through him to the church at Ephesus. These are actually the last words we have written by the Apostle Paul. They, are, they come after everything else. And I believe in the same way, Paul is not wasting breath here, so to speak. Paul, it is clear, we will see by the end of the letter, knows he is not going to survive. He realizes he's on trial before Caesar, and this is going to end with him being martyred. He's not even certain that Timothy's going to make it there to see him. If you were in that place, I dare say you would think carefully about what was most important to you. And that's what Paul is doing here in 2 Timothy. So we're going to dive in. Today we begin with kind of the introduction to the letter. And Notice Paul here as a father gives a very fond and warm greeting to Timothy. Now, I say that it begins very formally like his other letters. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. This sounds pretty standard for Paul's letters. In fact, Paul almost always stresses his apostleship, and he very often says it's by the will of God. He does that in 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, and it's pretty similar to the first letter that he had already written to Timothy. And in virtually every letter, he stresses that he is an apostle. For this reason, some scholars have started over the last 100 or 200 years to say, I don't think Paul really wrote this. It sounds too formal. I mean, Paul's writing to probably the person on earth he's closest to, Timothy. It's a personal letter. Why would you start by saying, I'm Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus? And they would point out, you know, if I were to write one of my kids, I probably wouldn't say, you know, Brett, a pastor of, I'd say, hey, it's dad, right? And they're kind of wondering, well, why would Paul do this? Uh, And Timothy knows that Paul is an apostle by God's will. He's been with Paul through thick and thin, so why would Paul do it? But there are actually good reasons why Paul is doing it. Because number one, we have to remember, this is not like a FaceTime video. Paul's sending a letter across thousands of miles, and he's actually, we're going to see, not only writing to Timothy, he's writing through Timothy to the church still. And they know Whenever Paul begins his letters, he begins his letters a certain way. And so it's kind of a mark of authenticity, if you will. Kind of like when we sign in on a website and you got a password or a pen. Part of Paul's is, this is how I begin my letters. This is how I started. And so he's doing that. And we're going to see, again, he's writing to the church, but we are going to find out he's going to get personal real quick here in a way he does not do in the other letters. So you may hear if you start doing some reading on 2 Timothy, you know, ah, this is not one that Paul wrote. All of this stuff, there's no credence to it whatsoever. The only reason, in fact, what they say basically is, well, this verse doesn't sound like Paul. And the next verse, it sounds too much like Paul. Like somebody's copying him. It's like, you know, (laughs) They're cursed if they do, and they're cursed if they don't. It doesn't matter what's going on here. You've already decided you don't think Paul wrote it, so you're just looking for reasons. But there's really every reason to believe what the early church told us, which is that this was written by the Apostle Paul. And notice he quickly dives in, and he starts dealing with the fact that Timothy is his spiritual son. And it gets very intimate and close very quick. He says, I'm writing to Timothy my dear son, and in grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, which is pretty typical. But notice that phrase there, to Timothy, my dear son. Now we know Timothy is not Paul's physical son. Paul did not have a physical son. And we know, I'll be covering in after hours this week if you look at it, we know that actually Timothy's father was Greek. He was not Jewish. That comes up with certain issues, and I'll be kind of going over Timothy's bio a little bit on Tuesday. You can dig and listen in, but 
But Timothy is Paul's spiritual son. And rabbis and philosophers at this time very often use that term for their close followers. They refer to them as their sons. Now, Paul also, to be sure, did call Timothy his fellow worker. In Romans chapter 16, verse 21, he referred to Timothy as my fellow worker. And he referred to him as the brother. Timothy, my brother or the brother. 2 Corinthians 1.1, Philippians 1.1, Colossians 1.1. In fact, if you listen on to the after hours, I point out that Timothy's name is listed as kind of a co-author with Paul of a number of letters. He's right up front because Timothy is very well known to the churches. In fact, he's more well known than any of Paul's other co-workers. But despite this fact, most often Paul refers to Timothy as his son. So for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul's writing to Corinth. And you remember the church of Corinth is in trouble. They're, they're kind of a mess. And in fact, he's sending Timothy back to Corinth to try and fix the problems. And he says, for this reason, I am sending to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. Now, Paul's, I, I mean, it's just when he says Timothy, Paul has a tendency to say he's my son, but he's not just my son, he's my son that I love. There is a special bond between me and Timothy. In fact, in the first letter that he wrote to Timothy, he says to Timothy, my true son in the faith. There, notice, because Timothy's having to deal with false believers and false teachers, Paul is saying Timothy's the real deal. He's the genuine article. He is one, if you want to know what I think and feel and believe, ask Timothy. Because he knows me like a son knows his father. And then in 1 Timothy 1.18, he says, Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction. Which again is an interesting thing. Paul's rattling off instructions of what he wants Timothy to do. But he just when he says Timothy, his natural response is to say, Timothy, you're my son. You're my boy. Now, he did this as well. You can look at Titus. He referred to Titus, which is another one of the pastoral epistles. He did mention in Titus 1.4 that Titus was his son. And also, interestingly enough, Onesimus, that interesting character in the book of Philemon, the slave that had run away and met Paul and became a believer through Paul, and Paul's appealing for him, and he refers to Onesimus as his son as well. But it's really clear when you look at the whole New Testament, Paul has good relationships with all kinds of other people. There are all kinds of people he feels affection for. And then there's Timothy. Timothy is the one that he really says, I have a special deep affection. I have a special deep bond. And so it's not surprising the farewell letter is going to go to Timothy. Because as we're going to see, the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm in a jail cell. I'm going to be dying soon. Who do I want at my side? I want Timothy at my side. I want him to be here with me. And so again, you can listen a little bit to the after hours. I'll even explain where Paul and Timothy met back in Acts 16 and kind of some of the background and and the ways they work together for why they are so close. But we need to get right from the beginning. This whole letter is couched in the terms that a father is writing to his son, his final words. Now, what does Paul want Timothy to know? Well, he begins, as he often does, by mentioning his prayers. Again, this is very common for Paul. But he notes here in 2 Timothy 1, 3 to 5, as he's talking about prayer, notice how much he's stressing his fond memories of Timothy. In verse 3, he says, as I thank God, as night and day I constantly remember you. In verse 4, he says, I'm recalling your tears. In verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith. And the NIV's done a good job because the particular uh, these three words in Greek are all built on one particular Greek word, menea, which can mean to remember or to mention someone. So you can mentally remember someone, or you could even mention someone in conversation or mention them in your prayers, which is what Paul's doing here. But the NIV is trying to capture, there's a little bit of a play on words here. Paul's saying, when I'm sitting around and I'm thinking, you come to mind, Timothy. When I am praying, 
you come to mind, Timothy. And when I'm just remembering things in my life, I remember the fact, Timothy, that you were, you were crying last time we were together because you were so sad that I was being separated from you. And all of this is Paul letting Timothy know. You got a picture. He's an old man. He's sitting in the jail cell. He knows the trial is not going well. He's aware this is going to end in martyrdom. And he's sitting there and he's looking back on life. And who is foremost in his mind? Timothy. He's thinking about him. He is looking at him. And he's thinking so often of his spiritual son, Timothy. And he's wanting to see him again. And notice there in verse 4, he actually says, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And this is clearly a, a mutual thing between the two of them because there in verse 4 he says, recalling your tears I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. See, he's saying, look, when we got parted, which Paul had to do a lot with Timothy. He would be in a city and he'd have to send Timothy off somewhere or he'd be in a city and he'd be leaving. Timothy, I need you to stay and I need you to kind of keep working on things here. And apparently the last time they had been together, and if you read through Acts, Paul had already been told you're going to get taken for trial to, to see Caesar. And it appears that Paul got released the first time. Probably they saw each other again but they kind of knew what was up. And Paul was heading back to Rome. Paul was going to be ultimately put to death. And as they separated, Timothy is crying. He, he's saying, you know, what's going to happen here? Not just because we're going to be apart, because that had happened many times, but he's realizing, like, I'm not going to, am I going to see you again? This may be the last time we see each other. And Paul says, look, I'm thinking about that, and I'm wanting to see you because that would be joy for me in a pretty dark place. And we're going to see in a couple of weeks when we look at the next section, Paul says, look, everybody's deserted me. I'm here on my own. Pretty much everybody around me that I thought was going to be here has bolted. And so I'm wanting you to get back here uh, to be with me, Timothy. But notice he doesn't just think about him. He is continually thanking God and praying for him. So in verse 3, I thank God as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. So when he thinks about Timothy, one of the first responses is gratitude. But just a little sideline, you know, one of the interesting things, our culture struggles with gratitude. Because gratitude means I have to be grateful to someone. We are trying right now to say, just feel grateful. We, we don't want to talk about God. We don't want to talk about anybody giving you anything. Just feel grateful. That's utter foolishness. I have to feel grateful to someone. And Paul says, I am grateful for you, Timothy. I'm grateful to God. That's who I'm grateful for. And I give thanks uh, to God for you in prayer. And he says, and specifically, I remember you in prayer. I don't just think about you. When I'm thinking about you, when I'm remembering all this, I go to God in prayer. And I don't just do this occasionally. I do it night and day. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this this morning, but I want to encourage you just as a sideline and you're doing this. How often do you and I give thanks to God and pray for our family and close friends? How often do you do it? As Melissa said just a few minutes ago, I mean, and I am grateful because I was getting back comments that Melissa didn't even see from people as they were saying, we are praying for Amy. As we sent out about our our niece's daughter, Brenna, I had a bunch of people come back. It's so uh, encouraging to hear and see how people are praying. Brothers and sisters, this ought to be our constant focus. Uh, I've been telling you, and many of y'all know because you get texts, if you're a member of Bay Ridge, I pray for you by name. Not just in general, oh God, be with Bay Ridge. Specifically, Lord, I'm crying out to you for Jer. He asked me to pray for this. This is what I'm praying for. Lord, there's Mary. I'm praying for whoever pops up on the list. Brothers and sisters, we need to be doing this. It is essential, and it is very essential to understand. As Paul's running out of time, he doesn't say, I'm running out of time, so I don't have time to pray. I'm running out of time, so I need to give myself to prayer constantly, night and day. One of the greatest needs today is for God's people to give themselves to prayer. I I am very excited as I've been 
texting back and forth with the guys who are going to be teaching this summer when, when uh, we're on sabbatical about the whole series in Psalms and about a summertime of prayer. It is so essential that we give ourselves to prayer. There is nothing that is more important for the church. And so Paul does this. And then out of that, he turns to give some encouragement to Timothy. He's telling him, I've been praying for you, but now he's going to start saying, but here's why I'm writing. There are some reasons. And he begins by, number one, reminding Timothy of their deep roots of their faith. Now, please, let me, I'm going to flip forward for just a second as to why he's trying to encourage him. Much of the letter is going to be dealing with the fact that Paul is suffering. He's about to be martyred specifically for being a Christian. Persecution has broken out under Nero uh, at the time that this has been done. Timothy is facing false teachers, and it's going to be very difficult for him in the future. So you need to understand, these are not the best of circumstances. It's, you know, in the, in the old Dickens, you know, Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. This is the worst of times. That's what's going on. And so he's going to write to give Timothy some things that can encourage him here right at the beginning of the letter. And first up, he says, I want to remind you, Timothy, of the deep roots of our faith. So Paul says, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did. Now see, Paul, I'm not aware of any of his other prayers where he puts that little line in there, and there's a reason why he does it, because he's going to link back to it with Timothy in just a minute. And Paul is saying, I want you to understand something. The faith did not begin with me. Think of your Timothy. What are we going to do when Paul is gone? You're going to do just fine. Because the faith was here before me, and the faith will be here after me. I serve God with a clear conscience as my forefathers did. The faith is not something new, Timothy. It stretches back. We've read about them. You know about Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. You know about Esther. You know about Ruth. You know about Moses. You know about David. You know about Father Abraham. They served God in their day. I have served God in my day. The faith did not begin with me, and it will outlast me. And so it's meant to be a source of deep encouragement to Timothy and also to us to know that the faith is not something new. I mentioned last week in the teaching, you know, that uh, kind of the, the Groundhog Day. We've been through many of the things that we're facing right now. That's encouraging for us. The faith survived crazy ideas that we're facing right now. It did not kill the faith the first time. In fact, we thrived and survived through it. Why do I have confidence that the faith will continue on now? Because we've been through this before. We, we have survived. The faith is not something new. And let me say this is very important for us. We live in a day where everybody wants to stress that which is new and novel, new and improved, right? Nobody says old and it's better that way. Everybody, even if we haven't changed anything, we, we've somehow got to say that it's newer. It's constantly about something being new and novel. We need to stand up and be countercultural and say, no, I'm not looking for something new and novel. I'm glad to have something that is tested and tried and true. It has survived across the millennia. It was here before our country and our culture existed. English didn't even exist back then. It has survived across cultures, across generations, through the rise and fall of various empires, and that gives me comfort. That's so important for us to grasp, and Paul begins that way. And so notice, it's not only that the faith is in general that way, he's also encouraging Timothy and saying, look, your own family has a heritage of faith. So in verse 5, he says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which lived, first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And so he says, look, the faith didn't start not only with me, Timothy, you know in your own life it wasn't here just with you. It's not when I first met you in Acts 16. Your mother was a believer. Your grandmother 
was walking faithfully. And probably Timothy's grandmother would have been walking faithfully with Yahweh before she even knew about who Jesus was. But she was ready when she heard about the Messiah, she responded in faith. And so he says, you have this heritage of faith in your own family. But notice he says in verse 5, and I am persuaded it now lives in you also. It's not enough that Timothy says, oh, grandmom had faith. Mom had faith. Paul says, no, I see that you've embraced the faith for yourself. It is a great heritage, and we need to pray this for our families. There are many in this congregation, as I'm praying for and I'm looking, I am praying for uh, young teenagers and into their 20s, where I'm also praying for their mom and dad, and I'm praying for their grandparents in the same church. And I want to tell you regularly, and then it's the opposite. When I'm praying for the grandparents and the parents, I'm saying, I am so glad to see the faith going from one generation to another generation to another generation according to the covenant promise of God. Brothers and sisters, that needs to be our heart cry. That needs to be what we are clinging to. Um, When we first started having grandchildren, I can remember running down the road and counting up generations, and I can go back like six generations of my family that are not believers, and I was like, okay, that's six, but you promised me a 1,000. I got 994 to go, and I'm claiming them all, 994. Every time I'm praying for my grandchildren, I'm saying, Jesus, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters to me is that they love you, they serve you, and they follow you. Everything else is is optional. I don't really care. We need to have that heart that we would have families that are deep, that are generational in faith. It is so critical. But for that to happen, notice It's not just Lois and Eunice. Timothy, I'm persuaded you've laid hold of that faith yourself in your own generation. There needs to be, the the, the blessing comes when there are deep roots of faith that are grasped presently, presently. And we're going to see that come out for, uh, in the rest of what Paul's trying to tell him. So these deep roots of faith, are meant to be an encouragement and a source of strength for Timothy and also for the church in Ephesus and for you and for me. It is good news that we were singing a song a little while ago. We all reacted and clapped and shouted, and I was watching. I was watching my brother Dennis there. He was was cheering it on (laughs) as we were singing, and I was saying amen. And that is based on words that have been around for thousands of years. That is encouraging to know that believers who didn't speak our language, not our culture, but they said, I believe that. I believe that. So that's the first thing. Secondly, Paul then reminds Timothy to fan into flame the Spirit's presence and gifts. So there's this deep, historic faith but Paul says, but Timothy, in verse 6, I re- because of this, because there's this deep root of faith, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. First off, I want to note, I'm reminding you. What does that imply that Paul has done? I've already told you this before. This isn't something new. It is a constant need. It's not just, you know, well, Timothy, I got a letter in and I heard you haven't been fanning into flame. No, I taught you this from the beginning and I'm just reminding you now. This needs to be a regular ongoing practice for us. And he's got this this word there that the NIV is translated fan into flame. It's a, it's a Greek word that literally means, it's three words put together, again um, and to live and fire. And in Greek, you can shove the three words together. So it's for the fire to live again, is what he's saying. So the picture is, you've all sat around a little fire pit, right? And you get the coals there, and it starts dying down, and you stir it up, and suddenly the flames start shooting up again. Paul is telling Timothy, I want you to do that. Like coals in a campfire, Timothy, I want you to stir this up so that it comes into flame again. And not only did he say, I've reminded you of this before, 
not going to get too technical on you, but it's a present active infinitive. And what that means is it's an ongoing thing. This is not once, Timothy. I, you need to do this once and then you're good to go. How often do we have to stir the coals up? I mean, it's regular. If you don't pay attention to it, the fire dies down. And Paul's saying you can't afford to have the fire die down. So I'm telling you, I'm reminding you regularly, daily, constantly, you got to stir up the coals. You got to fan into flame the gift of God that is in you. So the question is, what is the gift of God that is in you? And there's basically two thoughts on this. It could refer to a specific gift of the Holy Spirit. The word gift, the gift of God that is in you, is the word charisma, from which we get our word charisma. You pay me to give you deep insights like that. It's, it's charisma, from which we oftentimes have called certain Christians today charismatics, people that like to stress the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And this word is oftentimes used of what we refer to as gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit. It's used that way in Romans 1.11 and in Romans 12.6. It's used that way in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 and 9, and then 28 to 31. Paul uses this a lot when he's talking about gifts of the Spirit. He uses this word charisma. Secondly, notice Paul says that it's in you through the laying on of my hands. And it seems like this might be perhaps when Timothy was joining the apostolic team to go off of Paul. If you go back to Acts 16, you'll read that Timothy was a believer when Paul came into the area. He was spoken well of by everybody in the area. And then he goes off on Paul's team. And we actually read in 1 Timothy 4.14, Paul had written this to Timothy. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through the prophetic message when the body of elders laid hands on you. So he said, Timothy, you were given a specific gift when the body of elders laid hands on you, and there was even a prophecy about it. You were told what the gift was as you were kind of joining my apostolic band. And it may well be that Paul's thinking back to the same occasion. There he was talking about the whole group of people. Here, because it's such a personal letter, he's saying, hey, I was there. I put my hands on you. And, you know, it could have been, again, when Timothy was going off to join Paul's team. And it would not be unlike what we see in the New Testament, that for a specific mission, specific gifts were given to Timothy. So for all those reasons, it could be Paul is saying, stir up the spiritual gifts that you have within you. And at one time, I actually thought that's what it was primarily about. But what I'm going to argue now is I actually believe what it's primarily about is that the gift is the Holy Spirit himself. And the gifts are just manifestations of that. They're kind of the consequence down the road. But what he's really telling you to do is I want you to stir up the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. I want you to stir up his work in your life, which will, of course, include the gifts. And that's because the charisma in the New Testament are always associated with the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not like God gives us little toys and they're separate from His presence. The gifts are manifestations of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's not about, I've got some gift and it's my gift. This is the way the Holy Spirit is at work in me. So I do believe I have a gift to try and study and teach the Word of God. But I pray every week, I pray every Sunday when I'm up here. The Holy Spirit has to come and work. It's not like if the Spirit says I'm not going to work, I can say, well, you have no choice. I've got a gift. It doesn't work that way. Okay? The charisma are with the Holy Spirit. And then notice in verse 7, he's going to bring up the Spirit again. Now, the interesting thing is in English translations, you always, because this might freak a lot of people out, but almost all the Greek manuscripts we have, they're either almost all lowercase or they're all, all uppercase. So even God, if you got a lowercase manuscript, is all written lowercase. They also don't use spaces and all kinds of things, okay? So the question is, when you read the word spirit, is it my spirit or is it the spirit of God? Sometimes it's a little tough to know, but I think in verse 7, 
where he brings us up, he's really referring to the Holy Spirit. Notice in verse 7, he says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline, or some translations say a sound mind. I'm going to go over all those in a minute. And furthermore, this is all really, I have to break it up because we've only got so long in a teaching, but Paul's instructions continue on through this chapter. And in verses, uh, verse 14, he comes back and he's saying, Timothy, I'm telling you, you've got to guard the good deposit, which is the gospel. You've got to guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you, guard it with the help of who? The Holy Spirit. And there's no question here because he actually refers to him as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit who lives in us. And so I think right at the beginning, he's saying, Timothy, you need to fan in the flame the presence and the power and the working of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then as he moves along and he's saying, here's the challenge, you've got this deposit from God. And there's all kinds of people, as it were, trying to steal that deposit. How are you going to do this? You're going to guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. This is why I've told you to stir him up. And so Paul is telling Timothy and us, we have to fan into flame the Spirit's presence and work. So notice here in verses 6 and 7, I want you to fan into flame the gift of God. If, if I were writing, I could even write a capital G, gift of God, because that's what the Holy Spirit is so often referred to, the, the Spirit that is given to us. He is the gift uh, that, that Peter even talks about uh, on the day of Pentecost. And then Paul is saying in verse 7, he, he has given us a spirit, and here's who the spirit is not, and who the spirit is. Now what this means is, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we have been given the Holy Spirit, but we have to be careful to not quench his presence and work in our lives. So notice he's saying, Fan into flame the gift of God. In 1 Thessalonians, which interestingly enough is Paul's first letter that he ever wrote, he says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Now the next verse is, so don't treat prophecies with contempt, but test everything. So he brings up gifts of the Spirit, but the, the fire is associated with the Spirit himself. And Paul is telling the Thessalonians, hear this, in our first letter and our last letter, we've got the same concern. The Spirit is there. The Spirit is in you. God has given the Spirit to you. Don't quench Him. Don't put Him out. In fact, Timothy, do the opposite. Stir it up. Get the fire going in your life. And so, for you and for me, we have to not only avoid quenching the Spirit's fire, we are called to stir it up, consciously walking in and with and by the Spirit each day. We're asking Him to lead us and to guide us in paths of righteousness and to empower us to stand for the gospel. In the midst of a hostile culture, it is hostile when Paul is writing these words. How are you going to do this? You're going to do it not because of your natural you know, this is just kind of the way I am. No, because the Holy Spirit is in you. And the Holy Spirit is going to empower you to do this. What you're called to do is don't quench that. Don't put that out. Stir up the Spirit's power and presence in your life. And so Paul then reminds Timothy of what the Spirit is doing in us as believers. And first, it's kind of a negative. We are not given a spirit of timidity. So the spirit overcomes timidity and fear in us. Now, the word that the NIV is translated here as timidity, some have as fear, the, the Greek word dalios was most often used of cowardice in the face of battle. I've talked a big game, and we get down to the battle, and I get scared and I turn and run. Now consider what Timothy's facing here. Timothy, I've left you in Ephesus. You're surrounded by false teachers. They're distorting the gospel. They're causing a mess. And by the way, I may not even be here by the time you get this letter because they may have already put me to death. Okay, that's battle raging. 
But Paul is saying, Timothy, I'm reminding you, stir up the Spirit's presence in your life because God did not give you a spirit of timidity and fear. The Holy Spirit is not there to empower you to run away from the battle, but to run to the battle. The Spirit is given to uh, not give us fear, but confidence. And we're given the confidence because we know we are God's children. So Paul says very similar words to this in Romans chapter 8. And he says, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So we know he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And then he says, for you did not receive a spirit, notice how similar the language is, a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. It's like Timothy, listen to me. It's like David striding out to meet Goliath. And Goliath is hollering, and he is shouting, and he is bigger than you are, and he has more arms than you do, and everything seems to be against it. But God has given you the Spirit who whispers in your ear, you are the child of the living God. You do not need to fear. Do you hear Abba, Father, crying out. The same words that Jesus cried in the garden, and he was delivered from death, and God will deliver you. That's the message that Paul is giving to Timothy. So in the face of the enemies of the gospel and persecution, Timothy may be tempted to timidity. He may be tempted to fear and cowardice, but Paul is saying if you will stir up the Spirit's presence in your life, if you will fan him into flames, the Spirit will help you overcome. And how does he do that? He does it with the three things on the flip side, which is first, the Spirit lets us experience the power of God so that we can stand. So notice, the Spirit God gave you doesn't lead you to timidity, but the power, okay? He is a Spirit of power. And we can see how timidity and fear and power would be opposed to one another. And actually, if you remember back in the book of Acts, Jesus tells the disciples, as they're standing there, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to the ends of the earth. See, I mean, what a time. If you're the disciples standing there, you know, you, they had all fled in fear on the night Jesus was betrayed. And then he's raised from the dead and you think it's okay. And then he's like, well, I'm out of here. And immediately it is fearful. And he's saying, I'm out of here, but you've not only got to stay here, you've got to go to the farthest corners of the earth. How on earth are we going to do that? You're going to do it because the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And when the Spirit of God comes on you, He comes on you in power. Actually, that's the same phrase that's used when the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power from that day forward when, when God anointed uh, David to be the king. And so we're not left to accomplish the mission on our own power. The Spirit is God's empowering presence. But secondly, we're told that the Spirit lets us experience the love of God so we can stand in the face of difficulty. See, the, the temptation and the problem is, as you're looking, if you are Timothy, or us, and you're looking around and the whole culture seems to be turned against you, and things are struggling, and even people that you thought were standing firm have abandoned the cause. They've turned their back. They, they appear to have left, and all seems to be falling apart. Uh, Paul's telling Timothy, look, what you need to know is the love of God. When you experience it personally, it overcomes all of that. And so we're given a spirit of love. Well, what does Paul tell us in Romans chapter 5? He says, hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by who? The Holy Spirit. See, if it's not for the Spirit and all you have is an intellectual statement, I believe God loves me, when battle comes, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Because the enemy is going to be whispering, he doesn't really love you. If he loved you, I mean, look around. 
Look what's going on. Look what's happening. But see, Paul says, this is why you got to fan into flame. you got to stir up the Spirit. Because when the Spirit is there and He is at work in you, you are experiencing the love of God. And it's not a little. It is poured into you. It is until it overflows in and through and out of you. So the love of God is not an abstract concept. Through the Spirit, we experience God's love deep in our souls. And this is what the Spirit is doing in basically in every case. He's making the truth of God's Word and the ancient faith that we are confessing along with all the other believers, He's making it a present reality in our lives. Brothers and sisters, you will not stand by philosophy, and nor will I. We will stand by the present experience of of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And then the last area that Paul turns to is the Spirit giving us a sound mind so we can keep our head in trying times and circumstances. Notice he says, you've been given a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Now this particular word is actually used, it's the only time in the New Testament, but there's other related words. And basically it means prudence or wisdom, moderation, and self-discipline. It's kind of all of it tied together. That's why if you look at various English translations, you'll see self-discipline or sound mind, all of these ideas. It's all of these things together. And so it's referring to the prudence and self-control to meet the circumstances and do what's right. If you're Timothy, what am I going to do? Paul's going to be gone. How, how, how are we going to? The Spirit is here. And He will show you what to do. He will give you prudence. He will give you wisdom. He will give you insight. And He will give you a sound mind and self-discipline and control, Timothy, to do what is right. And so believers face trying circumstances in this life. And those trying circumstances, brothers and sisters, can tempt us to compromise, to shrink back. But as we fan into flame the Spirit's presence and work, in our lives, we have everything we need to live faithfully and to fulfill our call. Everything you and I can. I don't know what the rest of 2022 is going to hold, but I know this, you've been given the Spirit of God. Stir Him up. So let's apply the Word, and this will be brief, and we will come to the Lord's table. And in applying the word rather than so much directly asking a question, I want us to think through the idea that we are to grow in a strong, well-balanced faith. And there are three aspects of this that come out in this opening section. Number one, a strong, well-balanced faith is rooted in the historic faith. Some today, mistake make, look, and I spent time as a young believer doing this. I mean, what's God doing now? So that was what he was doing then, as if we can cut ourselves off. Like, you know, I, I'm only interested in what's above ground, so I'm going to cut the tree off at, root, at ground level, and it'll be better off that way. Uh, no, it won't. It will wither and die. That's foolishness. What God is doing now is helping us appropriate what he's always been doing. God has not changed, and we think that we're facing stuff nobody's ever faced before, but if you study the church, you'll find out we've been facing the same things over and over and over again. And so a faith that does not have deep roots in the soil of the historic faith is going to wither in hot days of adversity. So first thing is it's a, it's a faith that is rooted in, in the historic faith. Secondly, it is strengthened through close relationships. Notice how much Paul's talking about, Timothy, you are my son. We are, we are together, and, and you've got your grandmother and your mother, and, and Paul knows all this. There are these close bonds and relationships. So some today, again, mistakenly want to think that we can live our Christian life apart from vibrant, close, personal relationships with other believers but you can not. It is not possible. That's why when the elders prayed and spent a whole year going over, we said, well, what does discipleship look like? It does look like love our God. It does look like that I love God and I worship Him and I'm experiencing that. But what's the very next phrase? Connect. Because it always looks like connecting with others. 
You got to have roots, but you got to have trunk coming up. There's got to be structure there to do it. And so I want to urge you, if you are not in a connect group, get in one. Get in a connect group. You need vital relationships. A faith that is not strengthened through vibrant, close personal relationships with other believers will lack the strength to stand when the winds of adversity blow. You'll get blown right over. Third thing is it's empowered by the Spirit of God. Some people only want to focus on intellectual apprehension of biblical doctrine. I'm not against that. I spend a lot of time studying historic doctrine and, and, you know, I think I mentioned last week, you know, if you'd have seen me at two o'clock in the morning multiple times over the last week or two, I've been reading on the Trinity, delighting in the Trinity, okay? I'm all for thinking through our faith, but if all I've got is mental apprehension and I've got, man, I remember when the Spirit did this in my life 30 years ago. You're in trouble. You are in deep trouble. We must fan into flame the Spirit's current presence and work. And so a, a, a balanced, faithful, strong walk is going to daily stir up, fan into flame the Spirit's presence through the Word and prayer and songs of worship, through specifically asking Him to speak to us feed us, lead us, guide us. Uh, I'm going to actually, not this week's after hours, but the following one, I'm going to be talking more about how to actually walk in with and by the Holy Spirit. We need to do this, brothers and sisters. If we're not receiving that current, present walk of the Holy Spirit, daily nourishment through that present experience, we're only going to have what Paul writes to Timothy and calls a form of godliness that's lacking the power, okay? And we don't want that because we are living in the midst of an immoral and a corrupt culture. So here's the application. Look at those three. And ask the Spirit of God, which of these am I weakest in? Do I have a faith that is not rooted in the historic faith? Am I not building close relationships Or am I not daily being empowered by the Spirit of God consciously? If you had to pick one, which one is God calling you to grow in this season? Because then you want to to ask the Spirit to help you devote yourself to that, to be developed in that, to grow in that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to come to the Lord's table. And actually, communion does all three of these. In communion, we are rooted in the historic faith because this goes all the way back to what Jesus did. And we're actually going to quote the Apostles' Creed together. But it's called communion because who are we experiencing communion with? God and one another. And then we commune because the Holy Spirit takes simple bread and juice and allows us to commune with our God. So all three aspects that we're talking about are here at the table. So let's stand together. We're going to begin by confessing uh, the words of the creed together, which we sang a little while ago. And I remind you, it's so, so important, brothers and sisters, that the faith didn't begin with us. Never, ever, ever look for a place that acts like the faith began with them. It did not. We stand rooted and nourished through the ages. So we're going to confess the faith that other believers are confessing around the world today and have been doing for thousands of years. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the faith we confess. Go ahead and be seated. All who confess this faith, once for all delivered to the saints, who say, I'm part of that communion of saints. I believe in the Father, Son, and Spirit. Who say, I'm part of the Catholic, the universal church of God's people. You are welcome here to this table. For I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this, all of you, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Brothers and sisters, is not the bread we break a participation in the body of Christ. Father, we give you thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ who took flesh to work salvation for us. We break bread now, receiving all the benefits of Christ's saving work and thanking you that we are part of his body, the church. Brothers and sisters, take and eat. And brothers and sisters, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your blood, which has sealed the new covenant, paid for all our sin, and made us part of your covenant people for ever. Take and drink. Let's stand together as we together fan into flame the Spirit's presence here among us. Holy Spirit, when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, you raised us up with Christ seated us with him in the heavens, and united us with his body, the church. You are the one who dwells in us, convicts us of our sin, comforts us, guides us, gives us spiritual gifts, and empowers us to resist sin and obey our Father. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that you have met us today at the Word and at the table so that we have heard the voice of our Father and we have fed freshly upon the grace of God. So Holy Spirit, we cry out, fill us anew. We ask you now that the gifts you have given us may be stirred up within us. Holy Spirit, Drive far from us any timidity or fear. Spirit of God, come upon us and give us power and love and the sound mind and self-discipline we need to faithfully serve God this week. O oh, Spirit, develop in us a vibrant, strong, well-balanced faith that is rooted in the soil of the ancient faith, that is strengthened by fellowship with the saints, and that is freshly empowered by you each day. Spirit of God, speak to us, lead us, guide us each and every day this week as we walk before the face of our God. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of our beautiful and gracious 
and merciful Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You are blessed. Go forth and spread his blessing. Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.